Anastasia Palaszczuk and the Queensland Labor Party might finally have been forced to listen to voters, potentially pulling the pin on treaty negotiations in Queensland. Now, all the way back in May, the state parliament passed laws to pursue a treaty with some 150 Indigenous groups in Queensland. Those laws were actually backed by the Liberal National Party and the Greens. There was bipartisan support at the time. However, the laws were not popular with grassroots Liberal National Party members, or the voters for that party. The LNP was quick to claim that the treaties would not involve reparations or financial payments. However, voters weren't very convinced. The LNP voters could see that even if they believed those exhortations, the LNP might not even get its way, and therefore reparations could very easily be on the table. The ALP actually seemed to send mixed messages about whether reparations would be on the table. The relevant ALP minister, Craig Crawford, who introduced the bill, indicated that reparations were likely. He noted that in Queensland, treaties had cost up to hundreds of million dollars each, and there were going to be 150 such Indigenous groups in Australia or requiring a separate treaty, potentially bringing the price take of these treaties into the billions. This would have been an incredibly costly excursion. Where the money was coming from? They didn't tell us. How they were going to raise this funding? They didn't tell us. Whether it would come from increased taxes? They didn't tell us. Basically, they were saying they were going to spend a lot of money, but didn't have a plan for where that money was actually going to come from, although we could possibly read between the lines. Anastasia Palaszczuk, however, seemed to contradict the relevant minister, stating that she thought that there wouldn't be reparations and doubted that they would occur. Quite why she would doubt this isn't totally clear, given the relevant minister actually contradicted her, and therefore voters probably didn't actually believe her comments here. In any case, reparations were certainly a risk, even if they were not a certainty. And it's important to note, these reparations would be paid by current Queenslanders, who were very obviously not alive during colonial times. However, now the voice referendum has changed all of this, tipping the goal for treaties on its head. The LNP leader, David Crisafuli, has withdrawn his support in the wake of the referendum result. Tell us why the LNP that you lead can no longer support a treaty. Peter, because when Queenslanders speak, leaders should listen. And Queenslanders spoke, and I can tell you I heard them. Now, uh, what I don't want to do, having reflected on what's happened and having seen what I think would probably be the most divisive debate I've ever seen in my time in public life, I, I just don't want to put my state through what I have seen the nation put through. My priorities are Queenslanders' priorities. And what I want to do is focus on the things that Queenslanders are telling me about. And first and foremost is they want to see us united, not divided. And that's why I've taken this stance, having listened really, really carefully and, and, and reflecting those views. Now, the voice referendum clearly failed and failed miserably overall. It failed to secure a majority overall and didn't get a majority in any state, only picking up support in inner city locations. In Queensland, it was actually even worse than the overall national average. Fewer than 31% of Queenslanders actually supported The Voice. Only three divisions in Queensland supported it, and these were all inner-city Brisbane locations. One wonders whether the treaty bill in Queensland might actually have contributed to this, i.e. people were so annoyed by the prospect of a treaty that they wanted to send a message about The Voice which could have led to federal treaties. That is, it's somewhat similar to the cultural heritage laws in Western Australia. Those cultural heritage laws forced people to turn their minds to the types of federal laws that The Voice might ultimately pursue. Alastasia Palaszczuk has now used this as cover to soften her stance on treaties. In the wake of the LNP withdrawing its support, she noted that for the treaty process, you would need bipartisan support. I can't predict what is going to happen in the future. Seemingly trying to shift the blame, using this as an easy get out of jail free card for her to avoid going down the path of treaties, given how clearly unpopular they are. After all, if people didn't even want the voice, it's very clear they wouldn't want treaties, because treaties are a step even further, and involve even more draconian outcomes, and even more costs. If people didn't want the voice, it is incredibly unlikely they would want to spend billions of dollars on treaties in that case. So presumably, without this bipartisan support, Alastasia Palaszczuk wouldn't want to pursue treaties. However, Alastasia Palaszczuk hasn't explicitly confirmed the treaties are off the table. She's come out and said that without bipartisan support, treaties are not likely to occur, but she can't predict what will happen in the future, and therefore she might decide to just pursue them anyway. Voters therefore need to remain vigilant, and voters would probably be best served 
by voting out the Palaszczuk government because that would reduce the risk of treaties coming into being. Now clearly the LNP has not been great on this topic, and voters need to be cautious about what the LNP will ultimately do. However, the ALP seems to be more willing to go a step further, especially when you look at the federal rhetoric, which seems to be somewhat equivocating on treaties, possibly still trying to pursue them, even though voters clearly don't want them. Now, despite backing away from treaties, Queensland still seems to be committed to so-called truth-telling, so to speak, which itself is a rather Orwellian term. The next stage is truth-telling, and that's a three to four year process. And that's something that was voted on on a bipartisan manner. Now, of course, if by truth we mean facts and history, that of course is fine. But if truth is a euphemism and just means opinions, then it isn't. The obvious concern is that truth-telling in this context simply means propaganda and not facts. That is clearly a concern and it's enlivened by the nature of the referendum debate, where the government's own duplicitous rhetoric has created concerns that so-called truth-telling is simply going to be misleading, is simply going to be propaganda, is simply going to be marketing speak, rather than actual facts. So if one is going to go down a truth-telling path, one needs to ensure that it is in fact telling the truth, and is in fact factual, not merely opinion. And the Queensland government needs to take steps to ensure that is the case, especially given the nature of the referendum debate that we've had. Now at the moment, we can only hope that Queensland actually buries the idea of treaty. But overall, this seems to be a slightly positive sign. It suggests the Queensland government has been forced to listen. They might still want to do a treaty, but they might realise it is electoral poison. They might realise they would be wiped out at the next election. They wouldn't just lose, they would lose catastrophically if they try to pursue a treaty. However, like I've said, voters need to be vigilant because Anastasia Palaszczuk hasn't explicitly withdrawn treaties from the table. The Queensland government still seemingly wants to do treaties, they just know that voters don't want it. The federal government has also indicated they seemingly want to do treaties and haven't taken those off the table. This of course is really poor form, because as I've indicated before, this is a very clear agency conflict. Voters have voted for politicians to represent them. However, those politicians seem to be going off in a frolic and doing their own thing, doing their own thing and pursuing their own goals, rather than those of the people they are supposed to be representing. They might believe that they are so entrenched in their position, they're so unlikely to lose the next election in their safe seat, they can do whatever they want. So if it's a Labour politician, and they know they hold their seat by a massive margin, they might believe they are so safe, they are so secure in their seat, that they can pursue their pet personal causes, even if voters don't really want that because they might believe that a swing against them would still not actually remove them from power. Now, of course, some Labour politicians might be concerned, especially those who were in marginal seats, who perhaps only just came into Parliament in this last election, whose seats could potentially go back to the Liberal Party or the National Party at the next election, either if we're looking at the Queensland state election or at the federal election. We have to rely on those politicians seeing sense and walking back from treaty knowing full well that they would lose their seat if they don't, or be more likely to do so if they don't back away from treaty. But this whole voice debacle is clearly making it more difficult for Palaszczuk to win the next Queensland state election, and for the ALP to win the next federal election. And voters, like I said, need to be vigilant. They seem to be grudgingly going along with what voters want, even though they'd rather just trample over voters anyway. But I would be interested to hear your thoughts on it. Let me know that in the comments below.